Hey, welcome to the October Showcase, the Secret Writers Club. This, oh, the cat keeps opening the door. I hate my cat. Take two. Hey, <laughs> welcome to the October Showcase of the Secret Writers Club. This is an opportunity for writers in Wigan and Lee to share their work with the world. Um, no matter at what stage they are in their writing journey, which is really exciting. Um, tonight we have a mix of creepy little stories, one at the beginning and one at the end, which are fabulous. We have some sharp observational poetry, we have some dreamy poetry, we have some historical fiction, that's quite good. And we also have um, some like memoir and some feel good stuff. I think you will enjoy tonight. Um, let's start with Sheila Hines. Um, Sheila is a wonderful writer and a really good actress. I think she's really missing the social side of things where she gets out to perform and be on the art scene. Um, and we're going to start with a creepy little story by her, kind of thinking about. Um, what does the brain need? Hi, I'm Sheila and I go to Sunshine Writers. This is my story. It's called The Growing Thing. Christian loved books. From being an inquisitive toddler, he couldn't get enough of them. He got to know all the characters and what they were doing in the pictures. He couldn't wait to learn how to read. He pestered his mum to teach him. He learned quickly sounding out each word and repeating them till he got it right. He perfected his pronunciation and was reading fluently before the age of four. Staff at the nursery were astounded. They thought he was being pushed along far too soon, but Christian was pushing himself. It was as if he was impelled to learn and gain more knowledge. His parents bought him all the usual toys trains, cars and balls to play with, but although he dabbled with them, his books just took over. He was never happier than when he was engrossed in a book. The local library couldn't satisfy his needs as he read them too, too quickly. He then moved on to encyclopedias, devouring pages of knowledge with an eager appetite. Christian was now nine years old. His gift for learning hadn't wavered. He's way ahead of, he was way ahead of all the children of his age and he loved to be tested. Spelling bees were his favourite. His IQ must have been off the scale for his age, but his parents were reluctant to have him tested. His thirst for knowledge was, knowledge was challenging for his teachers. They complained to each other and felt their little school wasn't the right place for him. They were often unable to give him all the answers. Christian was just too clever. The weather suddenly turned cold. Winter was beginning to show its chilling face with frosty mornings. Christian and his mum went to buy a new hat for him. He picked one out that he liked. It was purple with a bright orange bob on the top. We'll certainly be able to see you in the snow, laughed mum. But the hat wouldn't fit Christian's head. He tried with all his might to pull and stretch it over his ears, but it was no use. They tried on several more, but none of them were large enough. In despair, his mum took him to the adult section. She tried on a maroon hat with a green bob. It fitted perfectly, so the hat was purchased. Feeling a little concerned, Jane, his mother, consoled herself and Christian, saying that they must have the sizes wrong. When they arrived home, Dad had just come in from a football match. He was wearing the exact same hat. Jane looked at him. Where did you get that hat? I don't remember it. Christian cried out. Dad, it's just the same as mine. You bought the same hat as me. He was really pleased. Well, what a coincidence, eh? I picked it up in my lunch break yesterday. The colour caught my eye. We're going to need to keep warm for the long walk I've planned for Sunday. But Jane couldn't help feeling concerned. 
She waited until Christian has made his way upstairs to bed, no doubt to do some reading. Then she said to her husband, Dan, have you noticed that our son's head seems to have grown rather large? I mean, it's bigger than the other children's of the same age. I had to buy a hat from the adult section for him. What? No, can't say I've noticed. But I've been working hard lately. I hardly had any time to catch my breath. What's for dinner? Down. Please listen. It doesn't seem right. I'm worried. Well, now you've pointed it out, I suppose it is a little on the large side. But the rest of his body will soon catch up. Children grow at different rates. Unable to convince Dan, Jane dropped the subject. A few months passed and Christian's head didn't stop growing. Eventually, Jane took him to see the doctor. He tried to reassure her and referred him to the hospital. Several eminent people looked pondered, measured and discussed the size of his head. Christian was put through scanning machines and graphs were produced showing his brain activity. Professors and surgeons gathered around to check the data. What it showed was a multitude of brain cells constantly firing sparks at an incessant rate. Christian's brain was so busy it needed to grow in order to store all the knowledge. They needed to do something to halt this rapid growth. But alas, they had no immediate solutions. They'd have to go away and think about it, saying they'd be in touch. The next day was a very serious Christian who came to his parents with an idea. He told his parents to sit down and listen carefully. Mum, Dad, I think I know how to stop my brain growing. His parents looked at him with obvious concern. I've spent the night going over this, so this is my plan. No more book reading. Dad, you can put them away in the loft. I'll watch Disney films and cartoons and play mindless games on the computer. I may watch the soaps too. Well, maybe not. But from now on, I will not watch any documentaries about the world and all its woes. I don't need to increase my knowledge, not for a long time anyway. I'll not watch or listen to any news broadcasts. I'll listen to classical music to soothe and relax my mind. I can kick a ball around in the garden or shoot a ball into the basket. Dad, I know that's what you always wanted. We could go to the swimming pool together and I would just swim up and down until I tire. Mum, I'll do the boring grocery shop for you and perhaps I could even do the ironing. You always said it's the most boring task ever. I can mop the kitchen floor, sing along to pop songs and all the domestic chores I can do. Anything that doesn't use my brain power. Christian's parents looked to each other. Maybe it could work, Dan. What do you think? We've nothing to lose. The experts haven't come up with anything yet. Why not give it a try? Christian, son, you are and will always be the bravest boy. So the decision was made. Time moved on and Christian grew into his teenage years. He occupied himself with mundane tasks. His room had never been so tidy and clean. Best of all, his head stayed exactly the same size. But his body grew taller and stronger with all the exercise he did. The ex experts were baffled, but Christian wasn't. Mindless tasks were what he needed. And the films and TV he watched didn't stretch his brain at all. Life was transformed for Christian and his parents. As an adult, Christian still had enough knowledge to become an expert on the power of the brain and what it can achieve. He gave conferences all over the world and wrote many books. But he did his own cleaning, shopping and ironing. And he kept up with his sport, especially the swimming. He had realised the importance of mindless, repetitive activity that it's certainly good for the brain. Thank you.
at one point in that I'm wondering like is his head gonna get so big, big it explodes and there'll be like brains and knowledge all over the room but it didn't did it he found a way to solve his difficulties I thought that was quite interesting a bit of a twist as well because at first I wondered if it was going to be a story about um you know like the evils of watching tv but it was so much more than that um, the other thing that's good to know about Sheila is that she's really massively interested in history and knows quite a lot of stuff. So when she writes historical fiction, it's factually accurate. Um, so if you want to follow us now to a different world, a place of the sufferer, Jets. This story is called The Straw Bolter. I am a straw bolter. I've been expertly weaved from the strongest straw. I sit proudly on the head of my wearer as she marches through the streets of this city. Her name is Edith. She walks tall and her steps are placed firmly, as if she's on an important mission. I hold myself straight and stoic, no tilt to the side. My wide silk ribbons are tied tightly in a big bow under her firm young chin. My crown fits her head perfectly, and it would take a gale force wind to move me. No slight breeze could steer me from my course. I sensed there is a serious job today. I felt the tension as I was placed on Edith's bed this morning. This was not a day for a casual stroll. Edith checked herself several times in the mirror. She fixed extra hairpins to hold her wayward curly hair, ensuring it remained tightly in place. Her belt was adjusted round her waist more than once. Buttons were checked and she brushed and smoothed down the dark blue jacket she wore. The long, heavy grey skirt hid her lithe frame. She seemed to have lost weight recently. Her boots were tightly laced after she'd polished them with a fast, determined hand. She prepared breakfast but didn't eat it. She speedily drank two cups of strong tea and kept checking the clock. The air was filled with a strong air of apprehension and Edith seemed agitated Whatever this day was about, it didn't seem to bring joy. I was the last part of her apparel to be added and complimented her outfit. After Edith checked her reflection once more, we went outside. Minutes later, other women came to join us. They greeted each other, speaking and nodding in a hushed, serious manner. Some of them wore sashes and others held up banners. Many more women came along and they formed straight lines. They walked steadily at first, then proceeded down the lane, moving in a heavy, steadfast march into the city's main streets. There were lots of different hats of sh different shapes and sizes. Some had feathers, some with bright flowers. Others were made with stiffened velvet and neck trimmings. Some were wide to shade a lady's face from the sun. But there were some that were very plain, dark and simple, pulled down low, as if to hide the wearer's face from public view. I didn't know why they wanted to hide their lovely faces. We made our way through the city's main streets. Gentlemanly top hats turned to look scornfully at the sight of women with banners raised, shouting their rallying cry, Votes for women, give us the boat! Ungentlemanly jeers of scorn were cast at the women. Bonneted children were ushered away from the sight by mothers who tut tutted at the shame on their womanhood. Children's questions went unanswered. Flat caps, the wearer's hands in pockets, stirred at the sight. Peaked schoolboy caps looped up from their marbles on flagstones, mouths open wide in wonder. We reached the market square where a makeshift stage had been set up. Edith walks forward and climbs the steps. Is Edith going to speak to all these women? My silk ribbons tighten beneath her chin. No time for silliness. I stiffen my weaves of straw as the midday sun brightens its rays to shine upon me. The ribbons round my crown change colour in the light. From the deep purple and everett green to crimson and emerald, Edith's arms open wide as if to enfold the crowd of women standing there. I feel her voice falter and tremble before she speaks. My ribbon ties vibrate encouragingly around her jaws. She takes a moment, clears her throat. Then, with a forceful voice, 
she cries out, My sisters, we are here to show solidarity to our cause. It is a simple request we make, but one that our government continues to ignore. We want to be heard. We want the vote. Are you with me? The crowd cheers and lets out a reply of support. Aye, vote for women. Give us a vote. Banners are raised high and fisted hands punch the air. Edith is the leader of these women. Whatever votes are, I want them too. There must be an this must be an important cause. Poor Edith, I feel she fear she's shaking. I keep myself steady and my balance firm. A hand tightens my bow again, a nervous instinct perhaps, for I will not budge from my altered position. A crowd is gathered here. Are they supporters? I'm not sure. There's a shout from the back telling the women, go home and intend to your wifely duties. Then I hear a whistle blow. Heavy boots are running towards us. Is that the thud of the horse's hoots on the ground? Tall emblet, emblet, helmets, black uniforms with glinting silver buttons coming towards us now with truncheons raised. What is this? Run, Edith, run. A shout comes from below us. But Edith, Edith stands statue still, as if she hasn't heard. She looks straight ahead, beyond the crowd. The women become a chaotic, struggling mass. They are pushed and jostled as they try to get away. Fine horses become feared monsters. Two arms grab Edith and I'm knocked sideways. I try to restore my balance, but it's too late. My tied ribbons are still under her chin, but now I'm at the back of her head desperately trying to keep my grip around Edith's neck. We are dragged away, but Edith doesn't speak. I want her to object, to cry out, no! She doesn't make a sound. Now I swing from side to side, and now on Edith's back. Her hair is in disarray and falling loose upon her shoulders. Pop collar skates are opened for us, and we are pulled through roughly. Edith's legs are dragging along the ground, as if her body has lost all its strength. We're taken into a bare, darkened room with a wooden bench. Edith is pus pushed forward and she falls onto a makeshift bed. Then I hear a key turn in the lock. I believe this place is a place is a prison cell, a place for criminals. Well, my lady is no criminal. What has she done? She spoke up for her sisters. Has she broken the law of the land? Edith unties my ribbons and places me, her, places me beside her on the bench. She lowers her head and starts to sob. All the tension in her small body is released as she cries for the, her plight and that of her sisters. After the crying ceases, she raises her head and says aloud, I will not eat any food they bring to me. I will be strong and face hunger. Yes, strong for the cause. They will have to let me go. They cannot let me starve to death. This day has ended badly. There is sadness and darkness all around us. But whatever Edith does, I too will remain strong. Yes, strong enough for Edith to pick up and place again upon a fine and noble head. I really felt the passion in that piece. Um, I think that piece came from a writing exercise we did around uh, an object if an object could talk and Sheila's interest in the suffragettes um, meant that she um, went with that angle which was amazing so thank you Sheila. Uh, next up we have Mr Brian Ratcliffe. Uh, I met Brian at Wigan uh, Write Out Loud Poetry Night. He um, was a retired teacher and I'd only just started writing poetry again after a long time of uh, just like teaching and being a normal human. And now he's really embracing the arts and like creativity um, and it's really exciting. So he's got two poems for us, one uh, quite sharp and witty and the other um, a beautiful piece of um, mem like memory. Oh, thanks for sending this in, Brian. My first poem is called On the Bus. What a kerfuffle, oh what a fuss. Woman threw a wobbler on the bus. Lifted me out of the twilight zone. Can't put that down to testosterone. 
A roughneck man in a baseball hat is all F in this and F in that. Limited language skills on the phone. We can all hear you. You're not alone. Conspiracy theories to the fore. Politics, football and plenty more. The metro headlines that spark debate. Bit of a hodgepodge of hope and hate. The bus is jam-packed and running late. Those endless roadworks make us wait. Ladies complain at having to stand while young men stay seated, phone in hand. I sit and listen, see what I see. A human tableau played out before me. A silent observer, they don't know it, but I am a public transport poet. My second poem I dedicate to my friend Sheila, who has supported me a lot with my poetry, and whose son Phil is actually the recipient of the items which are mentioned in this poem, which is called My Grandfather's Cufflinks. We used to go to your house for Sunday dinner, always roast beef. My brother and I wore our made-to-measure suits, paid for by Dad's annual bonus. You were kindly but austere, a retired baker, catering corps in the Great War, helping to feed the troops. I was eight when you died, and Dad said we took the news well, but did we really understand? They brought us salmon sandwiches from the funeral. A taste I have always associated with death. When my aunt died, I helped Dad clear the house and he gave me your cufflinks. They've been hidden away in my bedside cabinet ever since. But now I have gifted them to a young man who will wear them again, generations down the line. They will grace his sleeves as he defends my fellow citizens in court. Thought you might like to know how your memory is being kept alive. Thank you. Good looking court, Phil. I'd like to add, I think the Sheila in um, Brian's story is not the same Sheila as before. Um, I, what a wonderful way to remember someone by writing about them. If you're starting to write at home, um, that's a really nice place to start. To think about loved ones and people who've passed away. Um, we also like to think about the good times and the good times that have happened and our next writer, Mr Tony Topping, um, I met at the Sunshine Writers um, group at Skulls and then he came to Secret Writers Club and then he came to some of the uh, open mic nights at the old courts. Um, he's a fantastic writer um, and it's really exciting to support his journey towards writing his first book. Um, this next piece starts in Walgate um, I don't know if that was the name of it actually um, you know what Potteries is before they cleared it all out and um, takes us to Blackpool so a bit of reminiscence here hope you enjoy our Wakes Weeks piece Hello my name's Tony Topping I'm a member of the Sunshine Writers Group I'm also a member of the Secret Writers Group I write for the Wigan Athletic fanzine, the Modota, and uh, I also write for the official programme now, Wigan Athletic's programme. Currently working on writing a book about the 1970-71 season. The first story I'd like to read you is called Wakes Week. Early July, 1963 and a sparrow alights upon the roof of a small terraced house and is home to my family, but a slum to the bigwigs of Wigan Council. In 18 months time, the sparrow, should it survive the smog from the billowing chimneys of both home and industry, will have no rooftops to visit in this part of town. Every house will have been cut down by the council reaper. Being a small boy, such things cause no friends upon me. 
I did get a little agitated when the paper boy was late delivering my comics to my granddad's house. And I admit, maths gave me a headache at times, such as every time we had a math maths lesson. But today, I had only one thing on my mind. We were going an hour to Blackpool. We walked to the train station from our house in Walgate. I was my dad carrying two cases. Tickets bought, we joined the throng of people on the platform, waiting for the Blackpool train. I just had time to visit the newspaper kiosk and clutching my pennies, I eased myself through the masses and prepared myself for the big decision. Dandy summer special, or Beano summer special? Beano. Uh, no, Dander. Perhaps Beano then. Oh, damn. Anthony, hurry up, the train's coming, shouted my mum. Beano it is, and I hurried back to mum, dad, and my two sisters. The steam train, all smoke and noise, slowed alongside the platform and begrudgingly squealed to an halt. A mighty black dragon, eager to move on. Compartment doors banged open, and my sisters and I rushed in to save the seats for our parents. Cases safely stored in the overhead netting, we set off on our journey. Ten minutes later, my mum got the butties out, and I sat back to read my comic. This is the life. As we got closer to our destination, my sisters and I scanned the skyline, hoping to be the first to spot the black outline of the famous tower. And then it appeared, the man-made monolith of myth. We disembarked at Central Station and joined the host of holidaymakers packed on the platform, shuffling their way slowly to the exits. Familiar faces lined up with us, and I saw some friends from school. Dad, his mates from work, and Mum, well, she knew everyone. A year later, and this busy, perfectly good station would be flattened. I hope the Wigan Sparrow didn't come here for his holidays, or he might develop a complex. Outside the station, boys not much older than me, waited with homemade trolleys to transport the cases to your lodging house for sixpence. Dad put the cases on one and off we marched like explorers going into an uncharted land. We checked into Dun Roman and the landlady, Mrs Dun Smiling, informed us of the house rules. Breakfast, seven till eight. Off the premises by nine. No coming back before 4 p.m. Evening meal, 5 p.m. till 6 p.m. And the front door is locked at 11.30 p.m. She peered down at me and my sisters. Like a woman who had found something unpleasant on the sole of her shoe. And added, I'm no running. Unpack, we set off for the beach with its golden sands. Hang on, where was the sand? Every space on the beach was taken with deck chairs, prams, tea huts, snack vans, ice cream vendors, and the population of Mongolia. We managed to find a spot and settle down. Mum and Dad in their chairs, and we kids digging into the sand with our tin spades and bucket. Dad even rolled his pants up a bit. My sisters built a sandcastle. Now I dug a moat around it. Now to fill it with water. I set off for the sea with my bucket. I knew it was out there somewhere, but I couldn't see it for detritus. I gingerly made my way through the canvas maze, standing on feet, kids, castles, Butties, lovelorn couples, and mugs of tea. You could have tracked my progress by my apologetic, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, really sorry. 
Finally, I made it through to the beautiful blue um, brown sea. I filled my bucket with water and turned to go back. But where was back? A sea of pink and white flesh faced me, with a few sports jackets thrown into the mix. I tried to retrace my steps, but to no avail. And people tend to stir aggressively back when they're looking to see if they are in some way familiar in a did I stand on your calms earlier fashion. Eventually, my dad turned up in his budgies. I acted like I didn't know him. The state of that cosy. And I followed him back at a respectable distance. Our evenings were spent in various places. We went to the pictures, variety shows, the winter gardens, up and down the prom with all its amusements. But for me, the best place of all was inside the Blackpool Tower building. In there, I could wander freely while the rest of the family sat watching the dancers in the ballroom and occasionally got up for a twirl themselves. I loved the building, the Sornay, Tarwin and Grandor, appreciating the atmosphere even though I was a child. They had a small zoo in the tower back then, though the animals didn't seem happy in such confined spaces and it was closed down eventually. I had come to see one animal in particular, the black panther. I would sit on a stone bench opposite its cage for ages, watching him go back and forth and against the bars of his cramped home. I liked it best when we were more or less alone. Then I would stand against the safety rail and try to catch his eye, but the panther just carried on with his endless walk to nowhere. I concentrated really hard, trying to communicate by telepathy, the innocence of youth and the savage beauty of the beast, not quite on the same wavelength. With a heavy heart, I bid him a, I bid him a fond farewell. And though I never saw the panther again, I can still see him in my mind. My favourite place in the tower was the aquarium, down in the depths of the building and dimly lit. I walked amongst the denizens of the deep like a mini Captain Nemo. It was designed to resemble a series of caves with stalactites hanging down, adding to the authenticity. In fact, the aquarium had been there since 1875 and the tower was built around it. Little wonder I sense the ghost of the past at every turn. Some of the fish down here were as big as a Roman shield, and unlike the panther, they looked straight at me until I was forced to look away with a shudder. The statue of Neptune followed my progress through his kingdom with unblinking eyes. Friday came around too quickly, but with it came our last treat, a visit to the pleasure beach. It was our own version of Disneyland. Colour, carnival and candy floss. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. If you take out the boring hanging gardens of Babylon. With the setting sun came the illuminated lights of the rides and stalls. Primary colours pulsed around the black pleasure beach. It was magical to a young boy that lived in a little terraced house in a place called William. Thank you. I hope that takes a load of you back to Wakes Weeks uh, and if you weren't old enough to experience that then you know a little bit about our proud heritage. Um, now Tony's next story is a little bit of a tearjerker um, so um, we love that the arts can make us feel and um, so here's to all the fields. Thanks, Tony. This is my second story. Yesterday, when I was young. Last night, I had the strangest dream. I was young once more, and my old bones moved freely without the click and clack of worn joints. 
I could run if I wanted to. I was like a child that runs just for the love of it. A voice told me to move around freely, and I was allowed just this one visit. I was invisible to those around me, and neither could I speak to them, for they couldn't hear me. I stood on Scott Lane on a summer morning. The early sun was warm, and the sky was blue and cloud free. A double decker, maroon and white bus, passed me by and came to an halt at a bus stop adjacent to St Edward's. People left the bus and made their way inside the church, but the bus didn't move on. The reason became clear. The bus conductor was helping an old lady who had difficulty walking from the open platform of the vehicle. The conductor looked familiar to me, even from a distance. And I saw it was my dad. I started to walk towards him and I was just about to shout him when the voice gently told me that there would be no time for that, that I should carry on with my walk up the lane. Reluctantly, I turned and walked up past shops no longer there. Toffee bought after school, papers full of football results and chips and pea wet in a mixing bowl. Then I spotted him. At first it was a vague figure, shimmering in the sun, heading towards me. But slowly I realised who he was. It was me. A much younger me, with brown hair that cascaded over his polo shirt collar. He was carrying a denim jacket over one arm and his other arm held fast to an old army and navy stores kit bag. He wore baggy flowers and red Doc Martin boots, and I could see that he was on, to, on his way to work in 1974 attire. I approached to speak to him as he passed me by, but the voice reminded me that he could not hear me or see me. He strode past, and I watched him go, and despite the voice, I involuntarily shouted out, Stop! He hesitated. His walk slowed, and he turned and looked in my direction. He didn't see me, but his puzzled expression told me he had felt something. Then, he slowly, slowly, turned back and carried on with, with his original course to a place I did not want him to go. I walked from my dream with a start and such was my troubled mind that I found it quite impossible to rest easy for several hours. One thought kept me awake. What would I have said to that young man? Change your life. Change your job. Move away. Ask that girl out. Appreciate your parents. Be more confident. Stand up for yourself. Enjoy this young life. Don't worry about things you can't control. Too late for me. Too late. But not for you, youngster. Do what I cannot do. Thank you. Thanks for that, Tony. Keep on writing. Uh, I know you've got amazing stories in your still to be told. Um, and you had a, um, a story on BBC Radio Leeds, didn't you? Which is exciting. Um, I, I say exciting a lot in these presenting bits because I have a limited vocabulary when it comes to talking comes much better out of the pen where I'm incredibly articulate, much like our next writer, who is the fabulous Maria Byrne. Uh, Maria Byrne has just come on absolute leaps and bounds. When I first met her, I'm quite nervous in performance um, and sharing her work. 
not not nervous in writing, her writing was bang on, um, but she's been getting better and better and she's just been getting better and better as a performer um, and been coming to lots of um, poetry Zoom nights as well as in, when we have real life again, um, the night at the old courts and across the northwest. So um, I hope you enjoy Maria's poetry. Hi, um, I'm Maria. Um, I'm a poet, a Wigan poet, definitely a Wigan poet. Um, I'm part of a few writing groups like Sunshine Writers, Secret Writers, and Handwritten Pens. It's not long that I've been a part of the poet community in Wigan since I've not been performing since last year. I've got um, a few points for you. The first one is about visually what you see um, and what you see in a, a coffee cup. And this is called Dark Roasted. What better reflects stirring slowly? Dark roasted, aromatic scent snow. What thoughts loop back the bitter but warming flavour that stirs into the deepest of your soul and asks you, where do you want to go? Does it tell the future, does it mirror my thoughts? When reflected in a coffee cup, eyes looking, can they read my thoughts? It washes over emotion a tidal rich thump, a jolt of your heart. Is it just the coffee or just too intense? Thank you. This next poem is a poem I wrote about the moon. And it heard of the moon. And this is what came about. A wolf moon. A trail of lunar pathway past the eyes vault, past the celestial glow, the last barrier in space. The moon calls down to the urban soil and brings out the beast within ourselves and souls how to the tune of the wolf moon. What last one is about what you see in things again but from a different perspective. This one is about what you might see in the sky if only you took a minute to look up and it's called the blood grapefruit moon. The blood red super grapefruit moon peered down from the sky of semi precious stones carefully arranged as a hunter or a plough or even the great bird. The sky velvet black with a gossamer shroud, the ruby red betel juice, the sapphire alia and all the diamonds in between. The mirror of the sky was the earth below and the sulphurous and almost ultraviolet electric earth star. It was the stale night earth that manifest between the black morning and the blue dawn. The sound deadened in the street, except for an only occasional rumble of a car or van flying past the road. The gossamer throw had brought the cruel summer rain, and even so early on in the morning, the air had been mild and still heavy, sluggish. A figure tall black. This magical world comes into the light and threw off a shadow and carefully placed the shadow over another figure. The sulphurs gleam, the morning blood, grapefruit moon above illuminated a couple magnetically animated. The nervous laughter ringing and cutting through the silence like a stellar shooting star, the tall, dark figure 
are destructive and are often captured. Gentle, as if reaching to catch a burning meteorite, catching an ant and a jarring jolt, soft, light and early touch. Body language bends open, curve free, direct for a moment. The long awaited morning breeze, cruelly shifting the ebby, stale breath of the night, while breaths are without and eyes stir and take something from each. Tender touches are shared, perfume rises and sweetens the air, breathing, catching the back of the nose, spine tingling, it mingles with the smell of damp sand, the rain intensifies, falls like silver bullets from a lapis lewis sky, hiding the couple from the great moon's gaze, private moment, the euphorious meeting of potential taste, a cruel mint, and reading a soul in pictures, only wanting more, the sulphurous and ultraviolet stars cease to be and await the hot sun to embrace the lovers, forever imprinted in the stars in the waning sky, waiting for the next blood grapefruit moon. Thank you. Wonderful work, Maria. Uh, I can't wait to see what you're doing with your music as well, because Maria is... Um, a musician and has just started um, some university courses and is really exploring her love of music as well as poetry so I think there are exciting things to come and finally in October's Secret Writers Club Showcase Community Showcase yes 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 we have the fabulous Stephen Kenny he will introduce himself a little bit but I'd like to say that um, I've read so many of um, Kenny, I call him Kenny, not Stephen, Stephen Kenny, Kenny's short stories and they are phenomenal, um, like they're just so good, so I'm really excited that he's sharing Vector with us tonight, um, it's just deliciously creepy, uh, enjoy the rest of your October and um, I'll see you next month in November with some more fabulous writers, bye everybody, bye! My name is Stephen Kenny, and I am a co-founder of The Secret Writers. Um, the uh, piece I'm going to read for you tonight is a small excerpt from one of my short stories. It's called Vector, so I hope that you enjoy it. Thanks. Kyle sat on a lime green couch. The coarse material was scratchy against his burnt arms. The air was sterile, like all personality has been washed out of it. Hollow. In front of him was a large window stretching from floor to ceiling made of plastic. It was the slick, hazy kind like the windows in a tent. Behind the plastic, indistinct figures moved in a large laboratory, set up specially to study Kyle. When he was a child, his dad had had a little phrase that he fired off whenever Kyle complained about being alone. He never had many friends as a child. He'd always close in on Kyle conspiratorially like it was a big secret. If you ever think you're lonely or ignored, lad, stop paying your bills. People will pay attention to you then. He thought it was hilarious. Carl had recently thought of a revision for it. If you ever think you're lonely or ignored, try getting an infectious and deadly virus. That worked for him. That's how he ended up inside the bubble. Its official name is something like Vector Control Habitat something safe and scientific for the human scientists outside. Kyle called it the bubble because that's what it felt like. Like he was living in a man-sized snow globe. Air was pumped in to keep him alive and the temperature was always a little too cold to be comfortable. There were times when he felt like a specimen being held on ice. He was a specimen, of course. Something brand new to science something those scientists outside were terrified of. Carl had been a courier. He'd been a good one too. He used his own van because he felt that he knew it better than any company vehicle, 
Besides, there was something freeing about being able to drive your own car around all day. His van wasn't particularly large, so he tended to handle smaller packages. Nothing larger than a coffin. Sometimes he'd be picking up from exciting places, like military bases. Other times he'd be picking up from the back of a grimy warehouse. That was the reason that he loved his job, because almost every day was different. Small things amuse small minds, eh Kyle? On the day that his life changed forever, Kyle was scheduled to do a pickup at the airport. The instructions had been more cloak and dagger than usual. Phrases like, need to know only, and it is important that you tell no one about this pickup. This kind of thing always excited Kyle. He liked to think that he was part of a spy movie or a big conspiracy to save the world. Who can blame him? The man needed some excitement in his life. Before that day, his life was boring. Lived with his girlfriend, played video games in his spare time. He contributed nothing to the human race. And though he was ignorantly happy living like this, he was about to get a higher purpose. Carl reached the airport warehouse that he'd been directed to and found three men waiting for him. They looked like scientists to Kyle, bespectacled, sweaty. One of the men, the one in the middle, was holding a small square package, no more than six inches on each side and about six inches deep. As Carl got out of the van, the man holding the package spoke to him, his voice clipped and brusque. Open the back doors, please. Sure, yeah, I mean, I can just take the package off you. Doesn't look too heavy. The back doors, please. The man was obviously not keen on small talk. Carl moved around to the back and opened the small doors, standing back theatrically as the man with the box walked very carefully to the back of the van and placed the box into one of the back corners. He turned to look at Kyle, who stood leaning against the door, looking a little bewildered. Please drive carefully with this package on board. It's very, very fragile and any damage to the packaging could compromise the sample. The man handed him a small folded piece of paper. This is where it needs to go. It's not fur and they're expecting you. Got it. Your package is in good hands, sir. That's my own personal guarantee. Carl closed the van doors as the three men first backed off and then started walking back to the warehouse. As they reached the door, the one who'd carried the package glanced back at as Kyle got into the driver's seat. He waited until they'd gone inside before starting the engine and laughing to himself. Weirdos. The trip back from the airport was uneventful. Kyle blasted out the awful dance tunes that he loved to listen to, singing along badly and pounding the steering wheel when a particularly fat beat was dropped. He had other stops and pickups along the way, but nothing as exciting as the package as he'd taken to thinking of it. He was stopped at a red light when he unfolded the piece of paper he'd been given. All it had on it was a postcode, albeit a local one. He tapped it into the GPS on his dashboard and raised his eyebrows when the destination appeared on screen. Emergo Laboratories. This got Carl's mind racing. Maybe he was carrying the cure for cancer or a vaccine for the common cold. No wonder those science guys were so antsy about it. Once the light had turned, he headed off in his new direction with a smooth female voice telling him how far it was until his next turn. She was a brief respite from the heavy dance tunes that filled the van. As he rounded a corner, busy singing along to one of his favourites, Kyle almost ran into a cat. It shot out in front of the van and it was all he could do to stop before hitting it. He slammed his foot on the brake and the van juddered to a halt. There was a large bang from the back as packages were thrown all around the cargo area. For its part, the cat stirred at Kyle for a moment before nonchalantly moving off to get on with its life. Kyle cursed and, after starting up the van again, pulling over to the side of the road, he got out and headed for the back. He flung the doors open, his face flushed and his eyes glassy. The back was a mess. Packages were everywhere and he moved them frantically to and fro, to and fro only carrying about one, the one package. 
He found it almost exactly where the scientists had put it, in the back corner, only now the package had a tear in the side. He reached in and picked it up, bringing it out into the daylight to see how badly it had been damaged. The tear was bad, but he still couldn't see what was inside. He gave it a gentle shake, just to see if it rattled. He put his face near the tur, and as he did so, a puff of dust blew out from inside the box. As Carl went to sneeze, he breathed the whole thing right into his lungs. He suddenly found himself coughing unstoppably. He was coughing so hard it was making him retch. He leaned against one of the doors, coughing and retching over and over. Drool ran from his mouth uncontrollably until he finally vomited right onto the floor behind the van. In the struggle to catch his breath, Kyle hadn't noticed that the box had withered, turning black and somehow wet like it had been submerged in stagnant water for centuries. Whatever had been in there was undeniably ruined now. When he saw the state of the box, Kyle panicked. His heart was still racing from the coughing fit and his throat was on fire, burned by the bile he'd brought up while vomiting. Without thinking, he threw the box back into the van and locked the doors. He got back into the driver's seat and reversed quickly, not really knowing where he was headed, but knowing that he couldn't take the box to its destination now. All of that coughing would make his, he his head hurt. His brain thumped inside his skull like it was trying to get out and he had a faint ringing sound in his ears. His chest still felt tight and as he drove, he kept making himself cough, trying to get up whatever he'd swallowed from the box. It was just dust. This kept going through his mind. Just dust from the box. You saw the samples. They got ruined. Whatever was in there is done for. He ran through his mind. He ran this through his mind like a mantra, and along with the pounding of his head, actually picked up a rhythm that helped soothe him. It soothed him. His thoughts began to clear, and he came up with a plan. He would go home. He'd talk to Tracy. They'd sort it out. Get rid of the box. Tell the science guys his van got broken into. Simple. No, all he had to do was convince Tracy. As it turns out, the box was about to become the least of Tracy's problems. Kyle arrived at the terrace house he rented with Tracy. It was a modest home, just two bedrooms and not much space. It wasn't exactly ultra modern, but for the most part, everything worked. It was a little too cold in winter, a little too warm in summer, but it was their home and it had been for a few years now. Cal got out of the van and slid his key into the front door and as he stepped inside he could hear the enthusiastic tones of a PT instructor encouraging everyone to work hard. He walked into the living room where he found Tracy doing some step aerobics training. Tracy was a good looking girl with straight mousy brown hair currently tied back in a ponytail. She was wearing an old university t-shirt and some leggings. She'd worked up quite a sweat in the video on beads of sweat running down her brow past her chestnut coloured eyes. She stopped her aerobics when she saw Kyle enter. Hey on, everything okay? You're home early. She'd probably seen the, the worried look on his face and now her own creased with concern. For a moment, Kyle didn't speak. He sat down on the cream coloured couch and put his head in his hands. Everything's fucked, hon, he started. Something went really wrong with the delivery today. Tracy sat down on her step, stretching her legs as she reached out and touched Kyle's knee. How wrong? Did you crash the van, Kyle? Despite the tender touch on his knee, her tone was firm. I swear to God, if we have to pay out on the insurance again, it's not the insurance. Kyle cut her off. The van's okay. I nearly hit a cat and it fucked up a really important package. Remember me telling you this morning about that spy job that I had, the one that paid really well for me to keep quiet about? It was that. The package got ruined and I can't deliver it now. They've been breathing the same air for quite some time now, but these things are often slow in the beginning. Tracy gave a small cough and gave a small shake of her head as she tried to follow the conversation. Well, don't they have insurance for that kind of thing? I'm sure if you'll explain, they'll under... Tracy coughed hard and a fine spatter of blood coated the thighs of Kyle's jeans. They both stared at the blood dumbly for a moment, 
before Tracy began to cough again, this time much more violently. Thank you. If you've enjoyed watching The Old Courts Live and you'd like to make a donation to support the work we do, please head over to www.theoldcourts.com forward slash donate. This year has been incredibly difficult for most arts organisations and we're no different. But with a huge effort and support from you and from our funders, we've managed to secure our organisation and the jobs of every staff member. We've also provided 343 artists with paid work for the Old Course Live. And our volunteers have delivered over 700 food parcels and made 600 calls to isolated local residents. But the battle isn't over yet. We're currently closed to the public with zero income and we don't know how long this closure is going to last. If you can help by making a donation, then you're helping to secure your art centre. 